How's your money feeling? It's about to feel happier with a certificate from Happy Money's partner, Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. Elevate and increase your savings with 18-month terms and only a $500 minimum. And the happiest part? MSU FCU certificates yield 4.5% APY annual percentage yield. Now that's a happier side of money. Elevate your savings. Go to happymoney.com slash MSUFCU. That's MSUFCU. Funds insured up to $250,000 by NCUA. The APY is accurate as of the 12-1-2023 dividend declaration date. Early withdrawal penalties do apply. Fees may reduce earnings on the account. Any monthly withdrawals or transfers reduce earnings. Hello and welcome back to a final episode of Big Mood, Little Mood. I'm your host, Danny M. Lavery, and it's just me in the studio this week. I'm going to be reflecting briefly on what it's been like for the last eight years, giving some advice uh, in the Slate Studios. And then at the end of that, there's a piece that I've written over the last few years that in some ways sums up a sort of constellation of advice requiring situations that often tend to crop up together. So I I wrote a sort of helpful guide to someone in a very particular situation where you might be trying to transition like you're opening a candy wrapper really slowly in a crowded movie theater. The long and short of it is my advice is that you shouldn't do that, but I go into a little bit more detail about what that looks like and why. But in the meantime, this is my chance to reflect and sign off and thank you all immensely for staying with me throughout the Dear Prudence and the Big Mood, Little Mood years. I have a number of letters from people who've been listening for the whole time, and that's pretty remarkable. I remember when I started at Dear Prudence, I was in my 20s. I was a lady. I went and took a really professional headshot that I had to look at every week. And it's pretty remarkable to think of the changes that I myself have also gone through over the years. It's it's been a strange, beautiful ride, and I've enjoyed almost every minute of it. I had the chance to make a mark early in my tenure as Dear Prudence by establishing my belief that I don't think you need to bring a present when you go to a wedding, uh, which is not without controversy. And it's not even sh- I'm not even sure that it's one that I want to stand by. I just feel very strongly that if you go to someone's wedding, it's already expensive and that's present enough. And if you get a gift beyond that, good for you. But it was it was a lot to get thrown into, especially, you know, being like 27 years old and being asked, well, what do you think about wedding etiquette? Which was not something that I had a lot of experience in. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about being an advice columnist is by virtue of having the job, you are charged with a certain degree of expertise that you don't necessarily have. But just because you have the job now, it sort of matters what you think about that kind of thing. And trying to find a balance between the other type of writing that I do, which is often humorous, versus trying to help a great many strangers on a weekly basis and try to give advice that would be ideally useful to them rather than making a lot of jokes at their expense. And uh, it's interesting, too, just over the last eight years, there's really been a a huge uptick in, like, involvement in similar subreddits, like the sort of famous Am I the Asshole subreddit, um, and seeing a shift towards questions of, here's a series of characters who have made a a series of decisions, who's in the wrong here? Or, Or if no one's in the wrong here, who's the closest to being in the wrong? And once we've all established whoever that is, what do we do? How do we enforce the weight of our collective disapproval? And I think that's also been a, a really interesting shift. You know, there's been, I think, a few distinct phases in online advice giving since the early 2000s. There was a sort of like late aughts influence of like Dear Sugar and similarly like very involved and like emotionally present long answers to single questions. And that sort of later shifted into subreddit style, rapid fire, here's the story, let us know the 
basic outlines and then let's all collectively weigh in more shifts beyond that. Uh, and it's kind of interesting to be, you know, hanging up my hat. I, I am no longer in the business of advice giving. And so from now on, I will simply give my opinions in a personal and private capacity, which is kind of nice. I think I don't have a lot more than eight years worth of advice in me. I just don't have that much life experience or that many opinions. Um, I hope that if nothing else, I have been able to spare a handful of people from being in the situation that I consider worse than any other, which is when you begin by being angry at someone else who has genuinely wronged you, but then you you go too far. You say something that you shouldn't, and you are now in a position where you have to apologize to someone that you're already mad at and who has perhaps been more wrong than you for longer, but that doesn't matter now because you still now have to apologize for the thing that you did wrong. I hate that. I hate that more than anything. It's happened to me more times than I can count. Losing the moral high ground is one of the worst feelings in the world, Uh, and I can't tell you how acutely I feel like secondhand sympathy when someone says, I've been mad at my sister for 30 years, but then I went too far. I said something really out of pocket that I shouldn't have. And now I have to apologize to her before we can even dream about getting back to all the stuff she's done wrong to me. And so if there's ever been an opportunity to help somebody uh, avoid that moment, uh, I really, really hope that I've been able to help someone do it because just thinking about it makes me sad. It's been great. It's been fascinating. There's been a lot of moods, both big and little. And uh, I've enjoyed immensely shoving my oar in and telling a bunch of strangers what I think they ought to do. You are all now free of the weight of my opinions. You never have to do anything I think that you should for the rest of your lives. And I hope you really uh, enjoy that freedom. You deserve it. Frankly, you've earned it. So with all that being said, I'm going to send you all off with just a little series of thoughts that I have about trying to please the family committee while you're transitioning. Maybe it will apply to you. Maybe it won't. Hopefully it doesn't. Uh, But on the off chance that it does, I hope this saves you a little bit of time. Because I think that's really the most you can do as an advice columnist. I don't think it's likely that you're going to convince someone to do something they think is wrong or that they genuinely don't want to do or that goes against their best self-interest. I think it's rare that you're going to you know, stop someone in the middle of making a decision and say, on second thought, I'm going to do what the advice columnist says. But I do think within reason, you can sometimes save somebody a few weeks or months of suffering. And that's not bad. So I hope I've been able to help you suffer a little bit less. And if not, sorry about that. Thanks for listening. How's your money feeling? It's about to feel happier with a certificate from Happy Money's partner, Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. Elevate and increase your savings with 18-month terms and only a $500 minimum. And the happiest part? MSU FCU certificates yield 4.5% APY annual percentage yield. Now that's a happier side of money. Elevate your savings. Go to happymoney.com slash MSUFCU. That's MSUFCU. Funds insured up to 250000 by NCUA. The APY is accurate as of the 12-1-2023 dividend declaration date. Early withdrawal penalties do apply. Fees may reduce earnings on the account. Any monthly withdrawals or transfers reduce earnings. How's your money feeling? It's about to feel happier with a certificate from Happy Money's partner, Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. Elevate and increase your savings with 18-month terms and only a $500 minimum. And the happiest part? MSU FCU certificates yield 4.5% APY annual percentage yield. Now that's a happier side of money. Elevate your savings. Go to happymoney.com slash MSUFCU. That's MSUFCU. Funds insured up to 250000 by NCUA. The APY is accurate as of the 12-1-2023 dividend declaration date. Early withdrawal penalties do apply. Fees may reduce earnings on the account. Any monthly withdrawals or transfers reduce earnings. How's your money feeling? It's about to feel happier with a certificate from Happy Money's partner, Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. Elevate and increase your savings with 18-month terms and only a $500 minimum. And the happiest part? MSU FCU certificates yield 4.5% APY annual percentage yield. Now that's a happier side of money. Elevate your savings. 
Go to happymoney.com slash MSUFCU. That's MSUFCU. Funds insured up to $250,000 by NCUA. The APY is accurate as of the 12-1-2023 dividend declaration date. Early withdrawal penalties do apply. Fees may reduce earnings on the account. Any monthly withdrawals or transfers reduce earnings. We all need advice sometimes. Right? Someone to say, I get it. I've been there too. But often it's hard to know where to turn, which is where we come in. Hi, I'm Carvel Wallace. And I'm Courtney Martin. We're both authors and journalists who love finding solutions to problems. Every week on Slate's How To Podcast, a listener comes on our show to receive advice from a world-class expert. We've covered everything from parents with radically different politics to people learning to love their insecurities. We've helped listeners breathe better, sleep better, and even have better sex. Speaking of sex, we're all getting screwed by a warming planet. (laughs) So we've also learned how to cope with climate change and how to say goodbye to our pets. Life is messy and complicated, but we're all in this together. So let's help each other. Look for How To from Slate, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, and welcome back to Big Mood, Little Mood. This is a series of advice around a similar topic that I've given over the last couple of years, all of which has to do with transitioning and particularly transitioning within a particular kind of family context that I think can be broadly, generally useful. It could still be applicable to other family dynamics. Don't feel that if you're not currently transitioning, there's nothing here for you. But as always, take what you can and leave the rest. Let me save you some time. A Field Guide to Avoiding Transition by Family Committee. Over the years in my various capacities, as an advice columnist and a trans person who knows other trans people, I've had repeat encounters with a certain family dynamic that I call, just to be safe, let's transition by committee. No one family will contain every type listed below or go through all of these role-playing scenarios. However, the presence of one scenario or type is a strong predictor that most of the others are soon to follow. Plenty of families, of course, will simply reject a would-be transitioner immediately, and some, I am reliably informed, are supportive, or even enthusiastic. I don't have a lot to say about either of those types. I'm speaking now of that great, watery middle portion of families, whose initial reactions are usually described tentatively to friends as a little better than I expected, or, you know, I think everything might be sort of okay, or it's not like I expect them to start using a new name for me tomorrow, but whose every subsequent reaction after that is incrementally and relentlessly worse, without anyone ever coming out and saying so, frankly. They know that to reject the transitioner spells an end to the game, which is the last thing in the world they want. This family is unlikely to ever come out and say, yes, we fully and forever reject your transition, because out-and-out rejection forestalls the otherwise pleasurable games of scapegoat, we need to talk about Kevin, after everything I've done for you, just one more question, I don't remember it that way, get a load of her, etc. The idea is not to explicitly and for all expel the transitioner from the family circle, but to provide the rest of the family members with an ongoing opportunity to play doctor, rescuer, spurned lover, I'm only trying to help you, and council of elders. Here's a quote from Eric Burns' Games People Play that I think is relevant. When one is a member of a social aggregation of two or more people, there are several options for structuring time. In order of complexity, these are 1. Rituals, 2. Pastimes, 3. Games, 4. Intimacy, and 5. Activity, which may form a matrix for any of the others. The goal of each member of the aggregation is to obtain as many satisfactions possible from his transactions with other members. In colloquial terms, an individual whose script is oriented toward waiting for Santa Claus is likely to be pleasant to deal with in such games as gee, you're wonderful, Mr. Murgatroyd, while someone with a tragic script oriented toward waiting for rigor mortis to set in 
may play such disagreeable games as Now I've Got You, You Son of a Bitch. End quote. This particular psychic superstructure may not apply to your family, of course. And besides which, you ought to be able to transition whenever you like and at whatever pace suits you best. But if it does, I might be able to save you anywhere between six months to 15 years of wasted motions, years that could instead be allocated for silent sustained reading or a free swim or count towards a class pizza party. The first is called, but it's a family name, or the fall of the House of Usher. Say a transitioner comes out and announces their intention to start going by cat, rather than respond with, no, I reject this, you must not change your name, which has no real corresponding counter move, a relative, usually but not always apparent, suddenly becomes deeply invested in the long-standing family tradition of passing down the same name, with Junior, the third, and so on appended to it. This is delivered with all the state pageantry and solemnity of a Habsburg coronation, as if the transitioner were interrupting a glorious thousand-year genetic dynastic in Helectical Byzantium, rather than just having a few carls in a row. The pretense here is that the relatives would bless your transition if only they weren't so committed to maintaining a family tradition that underpins society itself. It's also known as the Henry VIII position. If only we'd had a spare, you might be able to live as freely as the commoners do, but you are the sole remaining heir of the Tudor line, and heavy is the head which wears the crown. Then there's the game called, Did Everyone Sign the Card? You thought you had done the full rounds of your top surgery apology tour when you get an email saying your great aunt's sister has some feelings about it too, and that starts the whole process over again. Much like a new assistant attempting to deliver a birthday card to a departmental colleague in a large company, there's always a surprise new person whose signature is also required before proceeding. A related corollary is, someone you don't know is mad at you, whereby family members begin privately informing you that somebody else, not them, somebody else, is cross with you, either for withholding certain information about medical procedures, real or imagined, imminent or merely hypothetical, and that you must find a way to soothe their injured feelings without betraying the confidence of the relative who told you they were angry in the first place. The primary role here is that of the busy bureaucrat, and the primary scenario is, sorry, I just work here. I don't make the rules. The next game is called, All of a Sudden Your Mother's Darling. Relatives who never previously evinced the barest awareness of your gender are suddenly saying shit like, I'm so proud of the woman you've become, and to a very special nephew, and but your breasts are such an integral part of what it means to be cousins, I've always thought. A sibling who had perhaps previously paid the transitioner little special attention might now discover within themselves a passionate attachment to the idea of brotherhood and insist on reinforcing this attachment with repeated invitations to axe-throwing bars and camping trips. Subtypes can include a parent who formerly never had a kind word to say about feminism, suddenly discovering they are in fact so incredibly committed to that movement that they couldn't possibly allow your transition to proceed a moment longer without a good old-fashioned consciousness-raising rap session. A sudden interest in psychology, particularly any studies about why are mothers, A newfound commitment to the gendered sanctity of bachelor parties? Do not be surprised, by the way, if you are suddenly inundated with corrective invitations to baby showers and other usually infrequent single-sex events. You may very well kick off a sudden rash of marriage and baby ceremonies among your social set merely by expressing curiosity in the possibility of transition. The next game is called, But I Was Going to Run Errands Today. This is a classic dodge. The problem isn't what you said, but when you said it. Upcoming weddings or christenings or illnesses in elderly relatives are especially popular, but so are on-the-horizon vacations or plans to return to school. The aim is to introduce the idea of a rota into the scenario, whereby each relative might be allowed to do something that pleases them so long as they take their turn in the queue 
and don't inadvertently cut in front of another relative who might have been waiting to self-actualize ahead of them. The next game is called, When Were You Going to Tell Us? This is a backwards maneuver. Whenever you came out, it should have been earlier. It's either delivered tearfully, Oh, I wish I had known sooner it breaks my heart that you might have been in pain and didn't tell me, or briskly, in which case it usually segues into the next game, which is called Team of Rivals, from Doris Kearns Goodwin's Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Lincoln's cabinet, which is prized among a certain type for prolonging civil disagreement into a permanent state of relation. There ought to be a committee. I ought to be on it. And if you really valued the democratic process, we'd spend the next 15 years taking straw polls before you did anything. The next game is called What Else Have You Been Keeping From Us? which sometimes leads into Where Were You on the Night of April 18th? Wild speculations, accusations, and hypotheticals will follow, as do lots of if-then statements. The goal of these games is increased surveillance. Ideally increased self-surveillance and unprompted admissions of various guilt from the transitioning family member. The next game is called Who's Going to Tell Grandma? which is often followed by You Can't Tell Grandma and sometimes even You Can't Tell Grandma that we know that she knows now. Very often Grandma surprises everyone by taking the news with delight and mentioning an interesting sort of fellow she knew back in the 50s who did the same thing. The next game is called It's Up to You, Just Promise Me You'll Never Fill in the Blank. Usually, change your name, tell the rest of the family, try hormones, get surgery. Sort of like, you can go to a restaurant, just as long as you promise not to talk to any waiters. The next game is called Old as the Hills. Usually, but not always, this is the refuge of a parent. It can sometimes be found in a sibling or a cousin of the same age group, but they'll immediately dig into their identity as old and therefore slow to change. So you're trans. How interesting. How even rather lovely. I am suddenly old. I am defined entirely by the time and place in which I was born. I was born in a certain place, at a certain time, with certain understandings, and as a result of this immutable fact about me, I may never comprehend you. I am ancient and unchangeable like the hills, and you are fresh and new and confusing as the dawn, which I might appreciate but can never treat as an equal. Then there's the game called The Check is Due, Motherfucker. This takes your coming out rightly as a show of vulnerability and leverages the opportunity to publicly list your past shortcomings, failures, and errors, which they have been mentally cataloging for some time. How can you think about transitioning when you still owe me money from that semester you dropped out of school? There's also the game of sudden confession. A relative might be seized with the spirit and feel moved to confess something similarly or even more surprising, but that is also wholly unrelated, also known as the no more lies maneuver, as when Jack Donaghy admits to dating a Democratic congresswoman in season two of 30 Rock and is met with a series of shocking admissions from his colleagues that culminate in, I murdered my wife. The next game is, if it's me, it's okay, or backstage pass. There's someone in the family who expects to be made an indefinite and singular exception to your transition on the strength of their unique connection with you. Well, we're so close, I don't have to follow any of those weird arcane rules and procedures as everybody else. Really, they're just loyalty tests of the kind I myself passed decades ago. Sometimes the relationship in question has in fact been a historically close one, but just as often, this comes surprisingly from an otherwise indifferent parent or a distant uncle. The next game is called, Do You Remember When? Relatives may suddenly become so plagued with nostalgia that they cannot see you without bringing up the most anodyne and long-ago anecdotes that provide plausible cover for leaning heavily on a former name. Well, that was how I knew you at the time, of course, and it was a very special trip to the stop and shop. I'll always remember it because of your birth name. The next game is called, Ow, my leg. No, it's nothing. Expect frequent, newfound references to an old wound. It could be either physical or psychic. An indistinct tragedy in the not-so-distant past. A great but vague loss. Anything to intimate 
that the speaker is struggling to bear a great and unrelated burden about which asking further questions would be terribly uncouth and invasive, and expecting them to take on any new tasks unthinkably rude. Then there's just one more question. This is the Columbo approach. I promise I'll go away. You've been very patient. I'm sure I've been an awful bother these last few days. Before I go, I just had one more question about what specific event from your adolescence led to this shocking decision. There will always be one more question, and there will never be a denouement. The next game is called You Wouldn't Hit a Guy with Glasses at Your Own Funeral? You can't speak to me like that. I'm in mourning for your past self, which is dead. This is a neat little trick whereby the transitioner becomes both the dead figure around which the funeral comes together and simultaneously a disruptive presence during the service who has to be corralled and even ejected by the appropriate mourners who belong there. The next game is called But I've Been Trying So Hard. This is a classic game upon which almost all the other transition deferral games depend. You'll notice that no one ever says, I've been trying so hard, and then follows it up with, and here are some of the wonderful results from the effort I've put in, or even with a specific example of some sort of change or endeavor or progress. In this way, it is remarkably close to, ow, my leg. The I've been trying person conceptualizes their relative's transition as a withdrawal from the family bank of shared credit. And they can't really understand why the transitioner isn't offering the family something of equal value to make up for that lost balance. Look at how hard I've been trying to let you transition. When are you going to offer me something in return? This type of trying does not usually result in improvement, and in fact has no intention of improving. This is effort for the sake of drawing attention to its own conspicuousness. It's designed to call an old debt into collection. While this list is hardly exhaustive, it does provide a fairly comprehensive cross-section of some of the most early-stage parries and deferrals that a would-be transitioner can possibly expect from the type of family that historically avoids direct conflict or avowal in favor of negation, substitution, indirect implication, and emotional bartering. I won't offer specific counter-strategies here since reactions can vary so widely from family to family, depending on size, history, cultural context, personal preference, etc., I merely attempt to outline the geography of the scene so that the wary transitioner might choose their own path or paths of least resistance. Remember that these scenarios are designed primarily to delay you and proceed at your own chosen speed to dodge or to barrel roll wherever you will. My only other suggestion in the idea of saving you some time, is transitioning like you're opening a candy bar in a crowded movie theater. This particular trap is most commonly encountered when an adult transitions in an otherwise predominantly cis environment. But of course, it can happen anywhere. Unlike the problem of transitioning by committee, the transitioner is very often the primary motivating force here. And as such, it can be a little bit trickier to identify. Have you ever been in a movie theater and heard someone else start to open a candy bar or a protein bar or a granola bar, really any of your classically wrapped bars, just as soon as the last trailer finishes, but before the movie itself begins in earnest? Perhaps you have done it yourself, not realizing the sound on screen would fade out the second you tried to prize apart two sealed sheets of crinkled foil and had to decide on the spot whether it was better to just go for broke and rip it open all in one go, or to proceed so slowly and carefully that you would make almost no sound at all. There's something ruinously appealing about the second option, even though most of us know perfectly well that it is impossible to silently open a candy bar, that slowness does almost nothing to the volume of the crinkling, and that the artificial prolonging of the unwrapping process is in fact far more distracting and irritant to the ear than one short, rowdy dismemberment. This is not a perfect one-to-one metaphor, of course, since there's no single uniform approach to transition, no universal moment of finality when everyone agrees transition has been accomplished. And in fact, 
Many trans people very much enjoy trying certain things out slowly, often one at a time, giving careful consideration whether to proceed any further after initial experimentation without taking anyone else's feelings into account but their own. But there are also many of us who preemptively foreclose upon a number of possible identities, actions, behaviors, changes, pharmacological and medical interventions out of an unshakable, if difficult to articulate, conviction that the only available way to transition is one, as little as possible, two, as slowly as possible, and three, while repeatedly seeking permission and buy-in from partners, parents, relatives, roommates, and various other authority figures, both real and imagined. You can call it the how-not-to-be-seen problem, if you like. The thinking runs as follows, often subconsciously. If I believe the most important people in my life will permit me to transition, that is, they will not kick me out of the house or immediately file for divorce or disown me or forbid me from ever mentioning the idea again, then I can come out or begin taking certain steps toward transition. But if these important people say something like, well, it's a lot to take in, or you've got to give me some time to adjust, or this all seems really sudden, or you've had a long time to get used to the idea, but this is the first that I'm hearing about it. It is then my responsibility to slow everything down to a nearly frozen crawl. Like how sometimes on TV medical dramas, they'll save a patient through therapeutic hypothermia, bringing the body temperature down into the 30s in order to prevent brain swelling or to buy time while waiting on an organ donation. Or red light, green light, or freeze tag, where you can only win if you always stop on command and never move without prior authorization. If I just go slowly enough and I stop whenever someone else says, time out, they will all eventually come around. I will get exactly what I want out of transition. They will painlessly and comfortably incorporate my transness into their pre-existing mental framework of the world, the family, and the body. And I can permanently ward off any ruptures, conflicts, failures to incorporate, contradictions, leave-takings, crisis points, or open acknowledgement of transphobia. Almost anyone beginning transition is likely to encounter at least one or two challenging conversations with a loved one, or to miscount one or more of their own desires or change their mind about a certain timeline or other. This is by no means universally applicable. The problem arises when a group of people who are committed to politely obstructing transition to the point of impossibility, while simultaneously believing themselves to be gracious, unbelievably open-minded, and even generous towards the would-be transitioner in their midst, by being willing to even entertain a conversation about a possible change a little further down the road. Their common refrain is, what's another six months? You've waited this long. You can't wait until after the baby is born, after grandma dies, after the job search is over, after the kids are older, after we've all had a little more time to adjust, after we've all had a lot more time to adjust. And the transitioner, who very often believes that they are in fact enormously lucky to be on the receiving end of such polite and affirming disagreement, rather than outright rejection and disgust, considers a few more months or a few more holdouts to be a totally reasonable asking price. I'm getting this transition at a fraction of the social cost. What a steal, they might say to themselves at first, suffused with the same pleasure as a bargain shopper who finds an unexpected double markdown. They believe on one level or another that their transition is fundamentally suspect, unearned, that it is taking something essential away from other people, that disappointment and dismay are legitimate, natural, understandable, even inevitable reactions to their transition and ought to be met with coaxing, refunds, bargains, barters, exchanges, and peace offerings in order to make up for it. They are willing to move as slowly as Zeno's paradox, which you may remember from math class. Achilles, the fleetest of Greek warriors, is set to run a foot race against a tortoise. It is only fair to give the tortoise a head start. 
Under these circumstances, Zeno argues, Achilles can never catch up with the tortoise, no matter how fast he runs. In order to overtake the tortoise, Achilles must run from his starting point A to the tortoise's original starting point T0. While he's doing that, the tortoise will have moved ahead to T1. Now Achilles must reach the point T1. While Achilles is covering this new distance, the tortoise moves still farther to T2. Again, Achilles must reach this new position of the tortoise, and so it continues. Whenever Achilles arrives at a point where the tortoise was, the tortoise has already moved a bit ahead. Achilles can narrow the gap, but he can never actually catch up. The problem here is that transition cannot be earned by behaving more plausibly, quote-unquote, like a trans person might, prior to transition, first because there is no single mode of behavior that everyone agrees a trans person might have, and second because even in such, quote, undeniable cases, cis people deny it just the same. Nor is it necessarily true that reacting to someone else's transition must necessarily involve mourning, grief, a sense of loss, of painful adjustment, etc. Very often, someone who is close to a would-be transitioner attempts to spin this doom and delay response as evidence of a great love. It is only because I love you so profoundly that I must go to the hills to mourn the name you used when you were six, the outfits you wore when you were 22, the lockers you were required to use before and after gym class when you were 14. These types almost never say upon, say, someone else's engagements, congratulations, I hope you have many happy years together, but please, first, excuse me, I must go to the seaside and shut myself away in a cottage of grief until I can release the phantasm of your single self. Or, upon hearing a pregnancy announcement, ah, remember the days when you could eat soft cheeses in unlimited amounts? That was your truest and most beloved self to me. I don't know what the current recommendations are for pregnant people and soft cheeses. I don't mean to imply that pregnant people ought never to eat soft cheeses. I'm happy to defer to the medical community on that question, but for the purposes of the joke, I think it stands. Treating transition as a loss is entirely optional, and therein lies the great truth that all of these glacial pacers are frantic to avoid. Transition is fine, and it doesn't actually require that much in the way of adjustment. It doesn't take a great deal of work to wrap one's head around does not, in fact, require months of relentless mental training in the new pronoun remembering minds, does not require a year of full mourning, followed by two years of half mourning, followed by 18 months of wearing lavender colors and smiling wanly at box socials. One can go slowly or go quickly or develop any relationship between time and transition they might like, but treading softly over the floorboards in a wretched little game of don't wake daddy pleases no one. In short, no one will ever thank you for transitioning slowly five years from now. Thank you so much for following the pace setters at the front of the race. It meant a lot to all of us. And because we had five years to follow clearly marked milestones on an easy-to-read map, we all ended up in the same place at the same time and really felt like we'd all come together as a family as a result of heading in the same direction. If you'd gone any faster, any sooner, we would all have collapsed like when someone in the Tour de France clips a fence and everybody eats it at the same time. But we didn't, because you transitioned with such sensible and admirable restraint. Thanks for cleaning your plate so slowly. Now you can have dessert. Thanks for joining us on Big Mood, Little Mood with me, Danny Lavery. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music. Although this show is ending, you'll still be able to catch me from time to time on Outward Slate's Queer Podcast, where I'll be occasionally joining the hosts, Jules Gill-Peterson and Brian Lauder, to deepen the listeners' understanding of queer culture and politics. It's a really great show. It's a delight to get to talk to Jules and Brian. I know we're going to drop a few episodes into this feed, so be sure to check it out if you get the chance. I also want to thank everyone at Slate who has helped to make this show such a pleasure to be on. And again, thank you to everyone who listened, especially to everyone who wrote in. It's been a pleasure navigating all of your moods with you, both big and small. And this is Daniel M. Lavery signing off, no longer available for advice giving. How 
How's your money feeling? It's about to feel happier with a certificate from Happy Money's partner, Michigan State University Federal Credit Union. Elevate and increase your savings with 18-month terms and only a $500 minimum. And the happiest part? MSU FCU certificates yield 4.5% APY annual percentage yield. Now that's a happier side of money. Elevate your savings. Go to happymoney.com slash MSU FCU. That's MSU FCU. Funds insured up to $250,000 by NCUA. The APY is accurate as of the 12-1-2023 dividend declaration date. Early withdrawal penalties do apply. Fees may reduce earnings on the account. Any monthly withdrawals or transfers reduce earnings. Toyota Thon is on, so stop in and get a great deal on an off-road ready RAV4 or spacious Highlander, both with available all-wheel drive. Find out more at buyatoyota.com. Hurry, Toyota Thon ends January 2nd. Toyota, let's go places.